Hi, I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing a series of webinars during the pandemic, and I started out because I wanted to visit with my friends um, and have you know nice chats and learn something along the way. But it's turned into a whole other deal, and it's so exciting that so many people are benefiting from these webinars. So thank you for watching, and just remember you can find them all on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. They're all recorded, and occasionally like this one, I put it up on Facebook Live. If you're watching on Facebook, just remember that we can't answer any of the comments until after the webinar is over, and then we'll try to get back to you um, and answer those questions. Today, my guest is Natasha Van Eyck, and she's from the Netherlands, and she um, has a school to teach people, professionals, how to fit bits. Fit yes. Yeah, I said it right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a start. <laughs> and, yes. um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to get started. I'll let her introduce herself as I do with all my guests, because I think they know themselves better than I ever will. So welcome, <laughs> Natasha. Thank you for joining me today. Well, thank you so much for letting me join. And uh, yeah, looking forward. Um, so introduction of myself. Well, I'm Natasha van Eyck, and I'm the founder of the International College for Professional BitFit Consultants, where I train horse professionals in this quite new profession. And it's a lot more than just changing bits. So um, I thought more people need to know about it, especially because it's a very important communication tool, the bit uh, for the horse. And yeah, I thought it uh, would be nice to give more insights, especially taking it a little bit wider than just the bit itself, because it's so much more. The horse is actually communicating with you through the bit. Absolutely. So Natasha, you live in the Netherlands. Have you been riding all of your life? No, I was actually quite late with uh, starting to ride. So I think I was 15 and it was because I didn't have such a good back, which of course never heard it when I, when I finally was a, uh, yeah, Not on a horse, when my right? parents let me ride. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but but no, I, I think that was just a way to get on a horse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, no, but I, um, you know, when you, I always knew I would work with horses. I only never suspected to end up in this profession. But the good thing is, if you just focus on what you really want, the right people and also the right horses enter your life. And for me, that meant uh, a lot of horses that were having troubles ended my life. And I always wanted to ride um, like Grand Prix, like every dressage rider. But I ended up... Uh, yeah seeing the horse more as a puzzle and seeing what he needs so then it becomes harder to combine those two because you need a really healthy horse so um yeah that's when i got interested in body work and treating horses and yeah um, so you also have done courses in body work and that what's uh, kind of a little bit of what is your educational background that got you to this place well originally i studied law <laughs> oh wow <laughs> <laughs> so that's something else. But uh, during my student time, I always uh, took courses in uh, Jack Marr method, the massage. Uh, oh, yeah, I met him. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but most of all, I learned also from people during, yeah, those I met. I met someone in Australia who learned me some manipulations. I met an amazing veterinarian in Germany who learned me manipulations. I did some osteopathy on an osteopathic school. Uh, so I've done a lot of dry needling, cranial sacral therapy, and then someone uh, invited me for uh, who's having a bit brand to do a bit uh, course, like for selling those bits. And I thought, hmm, I don't know, it's not my thing. But then the second day, because it was just two days uh, saying all the benefits of that brand. But the second day we were looking at horses ridden and they were changing bits and everyone was quite surprised because one horse didn't change on the bit. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense because he's not true at the back. He has the pelvis that's crooked. He was crooked there and he's crooked there. And I saw all these kinds of things the other ones didn't see. And then I thought, hmm, this can be interesting. So that's when the journey began. <laughs> you know, it's, I've always fascinated by how people wind up doing what they're doing now. And um, because I know my journey has been so interesting. And so it sounds like you've always had an interest in sort of what we call more complementary styles, uh, you know, body work, which in some ways 
um, Europe is a bit ahead of us in that for horses. I think largely because the horses are more confined. So you have to find other ways to keep them healthy and keep their body going. Whereas yeah. you know, we have bigger spaces and we turn horses out a lot more um, just because the space is so, I mean, you're a tiny country with a lot of horses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But what, what I found really interesting and what I didn't expect was that um, we always say the bit is a communication tool. But when something's wrong in a horse's body, they will show it on the bit as well. Mm -hmm. So all the small signs, the licking, the, the chewing, the, the sticking the tongue out, which is a little bit bigger, but pulling the tongue up, every signal is given through the bit at first. So even lamenessness, you can't even see it, you will feel. And so that's for me, it's, it's, yeah, it's getting more and more interesting every day. I'm, I'm still not finished. And so you established a school yes uh, how long ago did you establish that school uh, i think six years or five years okay yeah. and, and we now have international students? students but it's a bit hard with the traveling i know <laughs> covid but that's okay we'll figure it out eventually um but so tell us the name of your school international college for professional bitfit consultants which in short is icpbc <laughs> right. and stephanie's one of your students Yes, exactly. And we had on the other day. She, yeah. that was, you know, yeah. we, she was really informative and it was great. Um, and yeah. so you've been running this school and training people. And I mean, are you the only school that's teaching people uh, bit fitting like this in a holistic uh, way? I, I don't know exactly what others are teaching, of course. Um, I know it's getting more and more known, but I know for sure I was the only one, at least in the Netherlands, that right from the start, so from, from the moment I started with bit fitting, I combined it with manipulations and body work while the rider was still on the horse. Oh, so cool. that gave me a lot of connections that I'm pretty sure I'm the only one that can share that at this moment. Yeah, but right. of course, my students will, yeah. Right, but the, I mean, it's, so, you know, I've been to a bit fitting clinic and, you know, they had a lot of different bits and that was actually a Myler bit fitting clinic where we finally started to make ergonomically designed bits for the mouth. You know, they had some shape instead of just a straight bar. But, you know, when I was a kid and I still have the crate of bits and you just kind of go through your crate of bits and then you find your horse doesn't like any of them and then you have to buy another bit, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I know you have a presentation for us. So maybe we just jump right into that now. Okay, um, let me find the share screen. Uh, this yeah, one. things have changed a lot, which is great. And you know, th there's kind of these two camps. There's the there's one bit that fits every horse, and then there's the you know the camp of just use another bit to get what you want. But really, mm -hmm. you know, this understanding of the what the what the mouth is trying to tell us, I think, is really the important piece here. Yeah, of course, there's no bit that fits all mouths. That's nonsense. There's no brand that can uh, fit every horse, even though they have so many models, because then the material probably won't fit every mouth. So no, that's, um, that's something I don't believe. You just have to look at the individual horse. And that's why it's so good that there are more and more professionals coming in this area, because uh, some things you just learn by doing a lot and then you notice all the difference in anatomy of the mouth. So I'm really excited to tell you something about this new uh, yeah, profession. And I think it's not known that much in all countries yet, but it's getting more and more known. Huh? Yeah. Yep. So no, our awareness is definitely improving and changing and increasing. And, and um, you know, in the however many long years I've been involved with horses, it's really, it's really making some strides, which is great. Yeah, so, so every horse owner should at least, that's my aim, have a session with several bits to try and make sure they have a bit the horse is, yeah, the most comfortable with. But my advice is to use a professional and, yeah, do check their backgrounds because, um, just changing the bits or a bit fit consulting doesn't carry the load how we look at from the perspective I teach at the ICPBC, because we look at so much more than just a bit. And I just told you, uh, for me personally, it started with, um, yeah, combining small manipulations and body work. So um, I cheated a lot. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I can't call it anything else. If, if I see a horse react 
uh, or lean on a bit, for instance. So it's really leaning really heavy on your hand. And I know it's because he can't flex the ball because of a little blockage, which I know I can fix with a little manipulation, then I would do that. And I would change the bit afterwards to get the finishing touch. So I've always been cheating a little bit. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that, that's a pretty cool. I think the horse has learned me so many links. And um, yeah, I never expected to be like this. No, I, you know, I think that people who really follow their passion wind up doing things that they had never anticipated but that's the point isn't it that we follow that that passion and and it takes us into such fascinating uh, discoveries yeah because i've got so many examples but i try to stick to my powerpoint <laughs> because i'm thinking like oh i should tell this i should tell that um but when do people call in for a bit fit consultant well of course that is when they have a severe contact issue like the horse on the right which is pretty severe or a lot of for us in the Netherlands it started with a lot of dressage riders because they are high level performance riders a lot of them and they want to see if something can help them score better and improve the connection because yeah they have a focus on that of course in the dressage and there's still a lot that can be improved there but it's good that there is a start so when people go in, they always have the hope that their, I call it problem, is fixed with a bit. Well, it's a bit of a spoiler alert, but I can tell you sometimes it is the bit that's giving all the problems, but other times it's only a piece of the puzzle. And it's either a big piece or a small piece. So to solve a contact issue, you need to find several pieces of the puzzle which ask for a multidisciplinary approach. So and this presentation is way too short to go in depth about all the connections of the bid with the horse's body, but you can find some in your webinars already um, that there are connections like the Hyatt, it's a really interesting one. Um, and also the choices of bids fit certain compensation patterns. So that's even i think more interesting but it's too far ahead for today so i will just show you a few examples how the horse is communicating and trying to tell you something's wrong and how multidisciplinary that particular problem is so i will just go through one or two problems and then we'll see where it goes okay so um we all know that to keep the horse healthy we have this circle of management and everything is influencing each other well of course I edit here the BitFit consultant because I think it should be in your circle. <laughs> but you will see in this presentation that all the other ones also have a role with the contact on the bit. So I could have put this one in the middle as well. Yeah. And and dentistry is looking at the health of the teeth and the and the float, but it's not look, they don't ever ask to see your bit. I've never had a dentist say, Can I see your horse with a bridle on? Well, <laughs> To be honest, um, in the Netherlands, the, it started a bit with dentists selling bits extra. So they did fit the bits in the mouth. But the problem is to properly fit a bit, you need to see a horse in movement. Right. And if a horse is sedated, he will have lips that are hanging a little bit towards the outside. Um, and the size will be too wide if you fit it in there. So you can look at the anatomy of the mouth and say, okay, this link or this shape does fit or doesn't fit, but it completely changes when a rider is working on a bit. Yep. But I have an example of that. Um, I do think a bit is a marvelous communication tool, definitely, but it should be chosen wisely. So it gives men the opportunity to shape the body in a way that's either beneficial to the horse or to us. Or hopefully both <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but unfortunately I see a lot of times more us than both uh, but I do believe we all start riding for the love of our horse and we just need more knowledge yeah. so improving the horse's use of the body uh, so they can carry us better is definitely necessary and it's necessary to start with a communication tool that has no trouble on the wire and then I'm thinking of a phone line when I myself have a sore mouth or when I'm in pain, talking is 
pretty hard. <laughs> so that's the same with the horse. Unfortunately, when the horse starts screaming, people tend to think it's naughty. But most of the times you miss the signs. So I'm really thankful for the horses that learned me everything. Um, and I hope you all like to puzzle because, um, yeah, that's what we're going to do. Cool. So, uh, next one. The use of the bit uh, is true negative reinforcement. So I always think of how would I feel myself in a daily job when I work under pressure, but there's no relief or no reward for my correct response. Um, I would quite feel quite miserable, wouldn't you? <laughs> so you might think, but I do give a reward with the reins when the horse is reacting, but what if the horse is still uncomfortable in the mouth, even with the relaxation of pressure? So what if the bid is the wrong choice? So when a horse is uncomfortable all the time, it will compensate in a way with his body. So certain compensation patterns start in the mouth and end in the body, but also the other way around. So I have this example of um, a rider that noticed her horse was always a bit strong on the bit. So the, she decided to try a bit fit consult because she knew everything else in her management was good. So she had a physiotherapist treating the horse and the therapist always said, yeah, he's still stuck in the neck and he doesn't develop that much. Also, the instructor said, let go of your rein, let go of your rein, be more loose. So everything was in place. So when I went there, I found a damage under the tongue, on the bars. So the horse was definitely not comfortable with the bit. So you can imagine that when you are uncomfortable in the mouth, you'll tense your neck. So it will never develop in, in a right way. So um, when we changed the bit, you saw an immediately a change in posture and the neck was released. But what really surprised me, because that was a while ago, now I know, <laughs> but was that the rider would uh, be more light with her hands as well, straight away. Mm. So while the other bit, she and a horse got into a pulling contest, with this bit, they were so friendly, both. So yeah, it's, it's really cool. <laughs> yeah. So let's look at some discomfort in the mouth. And this is not the story I just talked about, but it is an example. So this is a double bridle. Here you see the snaffle. Can you see the green dot, by the way? No, actually I can't. Oh, then it's good that I have an error yeah. <laughs> in it. Yeah. Okay, above the first higher arrow, uh, yeah. you see the snaffle, only a little bit. And, in be and above the other one, you see the curb bit. Mm -hmm. And the highest arrow is pointing at some irritation. It's not open yet, but it's some irritation of the tongue. Mm -hmm. But um, the damage I want to talk about is the damage of the bars with the lower arrow, because that's open. That's the skin of the, that's covering the bars that's cut open. Wow. So do you have any idea what is wrong with this bit? I'm not gonna guess. <laughs> no? <laughs> okay. Well, this is, uh, and we, we, a lot of times we say uh, the bit works directly on the bars. But of course it shouldn't. A tongue should cover the bars and the bit should be on the tongue. So in this case, you see, um, yeah, it, it's not that way. The Can you take your pointer and point out the mouthpiece of the bit? Because I think it's a little bit not clear on this picture. Can, do you see my pointer or not? Yes, I see your pointer. What do you want me to, to point to, out? To, to follow along the mouthpiece, the part that's in his mouth. See, there's nothing, there's nothing in my screen up there. The only picture I have is what's down to the left. Hmm, maybe we're not, that's why it's like a little bit confusing. Okay. Um, yeah, see, where your pointer is now is on the, yes. blue, on the end of the blue arrow. Yeah, that's where the damage is of the bars. Correct, so and if you here, follow the mouthpiece, yeah, where's the mouthpiece? Yeah. This is the curb of the bit. Oh, okay, okay, that was hard to see. 
Yeah. yeah. This is the curb and it's going down and then it's going straight towards the sides. Oh, okay. So what we're seeing is the mouthpiece is literally on the bar. Yes. Okay. So and then the normally, is actually squishing around the top of the mouthpiece. Is that right? Where the upper arrow is? This is, uh, yeah, sort of squeeze between the, the curb and the snaffle. Got it. Okay, got it. Yeah, because we can't really see the snaffle for whatever reason. And so that was a little bit unclear. Oh, but now I see what yeah, you're it's an old picture. <laughs> okay, okay. Your pointer helped a lot. <laughs> yeah. So what you see is that the whole tongue is in this port. Right. So uh, you know that uh, a lot of bit brands say we need to make a port because it's nice of the tongue freedom. Right. But what if the port doesn't fit the tongue? So I will show you the next one's more clear. Great. Oh yeah. <laughs> so let's have a look at this random bit. So it applies to any bit with a port. So there will be horses that will fit a bit. So this, um, can you see the error now or not? Uh, it was there and then it just, there it is. It comes and goes. <laughs> okay. Now oh, this, here yep. it is. Yeah. So this is a, a bit that fits. We have a thick tongue, we have a high palate, and the bit lies in nicely. But if we look at the lower one, we have a palate that's low and we have a flat tongue. Mm -hmm. So what will happen with the tongue in this case? The tongue will be, because the palate will press the bit down, or the nose bend, <laughs> and then the tongue would go up, in the space that's made for the tongue freedom. But what happens then is the former picture. Then you have the whole tongue in the mouth and the curb hitting the bar. So in other words, the, the tongue is gonna go into that port because it's a space, but yes. when it does that, it's not protecting the bars anymore and then the bit hits the bars. Exactly, that will happen if the tongue doesn't fit the shape of the curb. Got it. Of the port, sorry. So and that would port. be true of a Western and an English bit. Yeah, it doesn't matter what kind of bit. I right. mean, I, I use a lot of dressage bits, but it, it's, yeah, it's on any bit. Got it. So what will the horse do in that case? It will open the mouth. Right, because that, it's not comfortable to have that piece of metal banging on that piece of bone with just a little tiny bit of flesh over it. <laughs> exactly. And when the port is too high, it will hit the pellet and you also want to open your mouth because especially when, when the bit is lying flat in the mouth, like here, then you don't have the rotation yet. But if you take the reins, it will rotate up, especially on Western bits, by the way. Right. Because Western bits are actually made by working on the pellet because every riding system is different. But uh, a lot of horses are not, if they're not happy with uh, the bit, they open their mouth. So there are, by the way, other reasons they want to open the mouth as well. But what do we do? We, all, we have a solution for that, don't we? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is the Dutch sarcasm because uh, we tie the nose bands. So if the horse isn't happy with his bits, we just shut it down. So there are many studies done how much damage a noseband can give. And it's actually hard to understand why people still do it. But I also believe that has to do with education. Um, I still think every horse owner does love his horse, or at least most of them. <laughs> we hope that they do. <laughs> yeah. But a lot of people trust their instructor who says, this is how it should be. And what is hard and... I always try to look at it from a perspective of the people themselves, because I've been doing bad stuff when I was younger with my horses, and I think we all did. So it's hard to understand that a noseband that is really tight will give a good feeling, because that's what's happening. Um, I wrote a few articles about it, and we can't talk enough uh, <laughs> about it, but the rider does feel an advantage because the horse will react more sensitive on the bit. So I've used the same uh, drawing, but now the, the circle around it is the nose bend. 
And you can imagine that when it fits, it already presses the tongue more, uh, the bit more into the tongue. So making the horse more sensitive on the bit. But when it doesn't fit, well, then you get problems because then where should the tongue go? Mm -hmm. Yeah, nowhere to go. Exactly. So, um, well, a horse also needs to swallow. So if you see these salivation coming from the mouth, then you know there's something wrong because, well, this nose bend is really, really tight. Yeah. Um, you see the horse has no, no possibility to swallow, even if the bits are pretty okay, because the bits from the side look pretty okay, but you see the extra wrinkles and a lot of bit damage is on the side of the bits. Do you know when they always say a snaffle ring, a loose ring snaffle will hurt the mouth more quickly on the sides? Yeah, you, he you hear different ideas. Yep, that's yeah. one of them. <laughs> yeah, but you can imagine that if the nose bend is tight, the skin here will bulge up and also the, you will have more wrinkles here. So, of course, this will hurt the horse more quickly than if you have a loose nose bend and the skin can actually move under the nose bend. Mm, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so that's uh, one of the reasons. It also has to do with when you have a really thick nose bend, sometimes the angle changes. Oh, okay. Yeah, because if you have one straight with the head or following the head, it's yeah more logical to to rotate through through the snaffle. But if it's in a different angle, it will catch the outside of the lip more quickly. Got it. So. Okay, another advantage for the rider to sort of have this nice feel when the nose bend is tight is that the horse becomes shorter in the neck and that has to do with this. Um, I always put this picture in it because if you press what is happening in your mouth, so your cheek mucosa is pressed against your teeth. Yeah. Um, the only differences between our teeth and the ones of a horse is that and um, this is a picture of a skull and here is the area where the bit normally lies this is the first molar and you see the upper jaw is wider than the lower jaw mm -hmm. so if we press against the we press the skin against the molars it will always hit the bottom of the upper molars and if there are sharp edges over there well then the horse will definitely move away from the pressure so he will tuck his uh yeah how do you how do you call this movement like yeah oh, oh suck is like sucking on a leg in and and we'll we'll do this he will go back like yeah he will not relax and and go and lean in it he will go back so it again it feels lighter so for um Horse owners, it's sometimes really hard to understand that a lighter feeling can be bad. And that's also a reason why I think you should have a professional looking at your bits. Because if you do the tryout yourself, you might end up with a bit that you think like, oh my God, he's so light. But he's actually light for the wrong reasons. So essentially you can have horses that feel, they seem light, but what they're doing is avoiding. And so they're contracting in their musculature instead of telescoping their neck and reaching to the bit. Yeah, um, exactly. But we tend to think, oh, my horse is light or, you know, and I see that also in the Western world where the horse will drop his jaw out, you know, drop his jaw down and they think that he's light, but really he's avoiding. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Where's the middle? It always comes back to where's the middle. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, true, true. We want them to be light, but we want them, we, we don't want this. <laughs> right. So another advantage, and that's, I think there could be really made a change, is that you still get higher points when you're in a dressage competition or where it counts to have the mouth shut. And then I'm thinking like, if all the stewards and the judges would know more, about the biomechanics and understand um, that while well, the nose bend shouldn't be that tight, then we could make a change. But still, 
I don't know how it is in other countries, but we see a lot of uh, tight nose bands. I still see them a lot. Uh, yeah, you know, education occurs slowly. Um, I can remember as a kid that saddles had a gullet that was one finger wide. And now, you know, over the decades, yeah. um, we figured that out. And so sadly, we don't seem to be able to grasp information and employ it right away. It takes time. Um, yeah. You know, but I always to try to. Education out. Sorry? You have to keep putting the education out. Yeah, I always try to let them feel what tension does. Because if you want to open your mouth and. Um, but you're actually shut down, you'll get tension on your TMJ. And if you have tension on your TMJ, so you will get tension on your neck. And when you're really tense on your neck, your lateral flexion, so your bending will go less. So I always let people bite on something really hard, making the TMJ tense uh, up and then let them rotate their heads as far as they can and then letting go of the tension. I can demonstrate it, but then I can't talk. So. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's okay. Um, and maybe you'll get there, but we do have a question about how do you use a noseband correctly? Um, well, it does have a purpose. So it should, you don't, you don't have to do it that loose that there's no purpose anymore because you see that sometimes as well. But I think a horse should at least open the mouth a little bit so he can swallow and he can lick and chew. Um, so not too tight um, they they have the rule the finger rule most of them measure it on the side but it should be on the nose um, there is a difference between a lot of heads of horses so if you have the finger rule on one nose it can be really loose and if you have the two finger rule on another horse it could still be a bit more tight so I always try to find out on which the horse reacts the best I'm just, yeah, it's, it's also a bit trial and error, but I don't say get rid of it. Also not the strap, the strap, um, or how do you call it? The flesh. The flesh. Yeah, the flesh could also have a purpose in uh, where, yeah, in keeping the bit steady. And for some horses that works really well, but on some horses when it's too loose, it will just uh, hurt the skin in front of the bit. Well, then you can lose it. So um, I, I'm sure you're familiar with the ISES, the International Society for Equitation Science. And uh, I can't remember who it is, but somebody's created a little tool. It's a little green yes. tool, right? To measure yeah. the, the degree of freedom on the nose bone, which is great. Yeah. Um, I don't know, have they started to use that at competitions over in Europe to measure? I haven't seen it, oh, no. Okay. Um, which is a shame because it, it would be nice. No. Um, to be honest, I don't see that many checks okay. at all. Yeah, I, I know in some places they've started using it, but I don't know how widespread that is. No, not, not yet, but maybe that also takes time because it's a nice invention, a green one. Um, I don't know and the it's, name. It's something that any steward can use and it's consistent. It's not yes. subjective. And that's what we need. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, um, when you look random or on a competition or even stock photos, because this is just a stock photo, I'll find, you see there's still a lot that can be done with bits because this is, you can see it right away, this, these bits don't fit. So we've put a lot of red dots on it. You see the nose bend is tight, but it's not as tight as the former one, but it's still too tight. You see here that with the snaffle, well, the... The snaffle is most likely to hurt the skin because the wrinkle of the mouth is so big. Uh, but what yeah. I notice most of all is this part. The lip is flapped towards the outside and the bit is just leaning on the inside of the lip, which is, of course, a lot thinner skin because this is normally flapped towards the inside of the mouth. <laughs> and here you have the chin chain and the curb, and you see their skin getting stuck in between there as well. And you have this part also pressing on the nose of the horse. And I don't know, I don't think this should take rocket science to see. So if we all just look at the set, and even if we suspect something is wrong, and you're thinking like, hmm, this looks weird, 
trust yourself, it is weird. This is not how it should be. It should look more comfortable. That's already your first guideline. So um, I will go to another example of a mouth that's uncomfortable. And this is also something you see a lot. And as a horse owner, it's very easy to check on wounds because this is a wound on the inside of the lip, happens lots and lots of times. And the only thing you do is grab the inside of the lip and pull it towards the outside. And then you will see if there's a wound or not. So I've made a little case study. And let's um, say this customer had the complaint, my horse has a wound on the left side, I need a bit that fits. Well, if I was a bit salesman, I would sell a bit for sure. Because a horse owner identified the problem, and if you tell them you have the solution, so the perfect bit, they will buy it at any price. The problem is, if it isn't gone after that, well, at least you sold a bit, you can think <laughs> like that. But of course, that's not what you want. So a contact issue should be assessed by checking the whole horse. And that's why I work with professionals and people with professional backgrounds so they can combine their own knowledge with bit fitting knowledge. So I've made, I don't know if it works, but I've made a little animation. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. <laughs> it goes, it slides a little bit towards the side, but it's just to show you what is happening in the mouth and then oh, this is the end result so the wound you just saw was created by a link so the link of the bit is catching the inside of the lip and that happens when a bit doesn't fit because um, say the link is too big because you can have a really big link, you can have a smaller link, you can have a single jointed, but as long as your bit has a link, you have a risk of the horse catching uh, the joint with his lip. If it happens all the time, well, then you have a problem. <laughs> so with this customer that has his wound on the left side, we first check is the link fitting the horse's mouth. So is the link too wide? If the bit is straight in the middle, is the link already there on the lip? Because that really makes the risk of catching the joint so much bigger. Or did she have a small link like I had on the little animation? Well, then that's not the problem because a small link will, will catch the lip less likely. But then we have to wonder, oh, why doesn't it go to the next page? Uh, what about the size and the thickness? Because if the link is still small, because here you have a small link, but the bit is way too uh, large in size, then even if you make a, sl a small movement on one side, it will go all the way to that side. Yeah. And it's also when a bit is really thin. We want a bit thin because we don't want much pressure on, on the GMJ, but we also don't want it too, um, too big. Um, but thin bits slide more easy. So you have to be careful with that as well. You want a bit to be steady in the mouth. So you think, okay, we have a solution. So we adjusted the size of the bit, we adjusted the length and we adjusted the thickness. But did we solve the case now? No, because the horse had only a wound on one side, which was the left side. So how do we go from there? So assuming that the bit now is fixed, or at least not the problem, that's when it's getting more multi-professional. So the next question is, do we have a strong rider or do we have a strong horse? And it's quite common to always blame the rider, but most of the times it is a combination. So it's a pulling, yeah, it's a pulling game between both. And if we look at this horse, you see he's tilting his head and yeah. he has a really tense muscles of the neck. 
So the rider is definitely pulling on the left, so this could be our case, and she's also having the nose bend really tight. So in this case, we, um, we look at the rider to know if the rider is strong, we can put rain tension, tension measurements on them. But most of the times it's a combination of both. So then we talk about blockages and muscle spasm. So if a horse is always strong on one side, there must be a reason. And we do test trigger points of certain muscles and also Hyatt connections. And what is so interesting about these points, and yeah, that's something you get along with during the years, that you can actually, by pressing these trigger points, you can get the same reaction uh, on the horse while standing still than what he's doing under the saddle. So I've seen horses where you check the muscles or check if everything's all right in the neck, and they will already start moving the jaw from the left towards the right or pulling the tongue up or showing that the discomfort is actually from the neck or wherever. So, um, let me see what's the, um, so if it, if this isn't addressed, so the neck isn't addressed, then with every bit, the problem will come back. Well, I'm not a saddle fitter, so I'm not a doing, I, you can't know everything. Right. But I do have an interesting story about a horse that also had a problem on the left. It wasn't a wound, but it was the tongue. And I checked everything. So I checked the bit in size. I checked the, the bridle, the neck, the rider aids, but I couldn't find it. And there was only one thing left. So we took the saddle off and we checked the back of the horse. And there was only one tiny spot where he was really sensitive on. And that was uh, yeah, quite a normal spot for a saddle. So then you check the panels. I mean, that, that was the only thing I can think of. There must be something in the panels. And it looked like a small twig was in there and it was horizontal and it was in the flocking. And I was like, what is that? But it was exactly on that spot. And then, well, you also have a trigger point because when pressing that, the tongue would also go out. So you know that's the cause. So they went uh, back to a saddle uh, fitter and it was actually the needle. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> so they've been riding with a saddle that the needle was probably forgotten in the flocking and that by riding it will go to the bottom. <sighs> and then it would hit him all the time. And that's where his contact issue came from. So in this case, I had to work together with a saddle fitter, but we did solve the issue. And, you know, and it really does take being a detective. You have, you know, to keep asking the questions and keep looking, not just to go, well, I've checked, you know, because I, I, I also know a story of a Western saddle when um, the horse, I can't remember what the problem was, but the horse had a problem. And when I checked, there was a nail that was poking right down into his back that was Whoa. out of the saddle. And so, you know, these things can happen. And, and if you don't look for it, you can't find it. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that, that is what it's, yeah. That's so interesting about this job because you just keep on looking and you learn more and more and more. Um, so yeah, uh, same with teeth. I mean, we now check the saddle, everything's checked, but it could also be the teeth. So uh, as a bit fit consultant, of course, you look at the molars and, and you, you take a basic look. I'm not a dentist, but there are bit fit consultants that combine it with dentistry because it's a very logical step to have interest in bit fit consulting. And if the jaw can't move uh, freely from towards the right and towards the left, well, then that could also be the cause why the horse is not bending. And same with, with the saddle. Now we were talking about a needle, but if, if a horse has uh, uneven foot, it also affects the shoulders. It will also affect the, the saddle and it will also affect the bending. So uh, especially the more complicated contact issues are multidisciplinary. Mm -hmm. And if you have a really bad case, you'll end up with uh, a vet. And that's a good thing that there are also veterinarians now following the education because I've seen many, many lamenesses um, 
that were the cause of a contact issue. And I've got some amazing stories about that. But first I wanna talk about a study that's recently done and they were checking horses unridden on lameness and also ridden. And some horses only showed lameness while being ridden. And in this study, the saddle was involved and also the rider. And the only thing I, was, I could think of was, but the bit, the bit, they should have looked at the bit as well. Yeah. Because a bit can, by its connections from the Hyatt to the sternum, from the Hyatt to the shoulder blade, can actually directly affect the stride length. So if your horse is lame, you will feel it in your contact. It, it will always be found, felt in the contact somewhere. And I had this really interesting case recently, uh, also a tongue problem, because tongue problems are really, uh, yeah, challenging. And this horse had the tongue out to the right and I couldn't find anything in the whole body. So it was, yeah, I mean, you can't solve all. And we were just surprised. So I told her and she said, what could it be? I said, well, it's definitely, if I feel the neck and I feel the muscle tension, it's from somewhere in the right leg. And she said, yeah, but where to start? I said, yeah, that's the hard part because he wasn't lame yet. Yeah. Because two weeks later, he went on a competition and he made a wrong step and he was really, really lame on the right. So they made a picture and he actually had a whole piece of bone loose. So, so he already had some, a little fracture, but it, yeah, it cracked completely. Uh, yeah, a couple of le weeks later and it was already shown by the tongue out of the mouth. Mm -hmm. So those cases are really, really interesting. And especially working with veterinarians because they can, um, yeah, you can work so well together. It's, they can uh, do the diagnostics. You can start to see the problems and start to work it through. But, you know, the veterinarians can, can do the workups and the diagnostics that can really help us. Yeah, exactly. And um, I don't know how it's in, in other countries, but I see more and more uh, veterinarians getting interested in all kinds of other professions as well. They also want to get more knowledge. And yeah, I think that's very, uh, very good and very interesting. Oh. <laughs> I think I only, uh, I've done something wrong here. But <laughs> I don't know. It was kind of interesting <laughs> that your foot pads right in the middle. <laughs> yeah, actually. <laughs> That, that, <laughs> that one was the the one like the first one, the circle of management, but then the contact issue in the middle. And my question was actually because I I didn't work with sure pets before, but that could also make a huge change in contact issue. So I wanted to add that at the last moment, and I see I added very very in the middle. Yes, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I think that could also help improve the contact because yeah, well, yeah. you probably have a story of that. <laughs> well, yeah, and um, actually if you unshare your screen, I'll, I'll talk about this horse that we had this weekend um, because we did a surefoot workshop for professionals um, in Pennsylvania this past weekend on two days and we had um, some volunteer riders and uh, they, they're both fox hunters and the one horse had thrown a shoe, so, so we, we didn't use him, but the other horse had been an Amish driving horse. Um, he probably was a bit Dutch driving horse um, and a few other things thrown in there. Um, and I do have, I'm just gonna uh, screen share this still shot. Um, but on day one, he was, this, this is mild compared to how he, he basically moved, very high headed and she, Everybody was concerned when she first got him. They were like, don't get this horse because he was so high headed. And what you have to realize with driving horses is they're driven in overchecks, right? Yeah. So they're driven so that they have to keep their head up and they can't really see and they have blinkers on. And we did one session of Surefoot on the Saturday and I used the hard pads, the ones you had in your illustration there under each front foot. I did a little and then he stood on both front feet at the same time. And he was very, very quiet. So I left him there for about five minutes. And when he walked off, his whole head and neck came down. And this is just um, one stage at which it was dropping. And we had to give her longer reins. She didn't have reins long enough to let him put his neck all the way down. But it, um, 
the difference was so striking. So, you know, you can have horses that have habitual patterns that they've been going in a certain way for so long, just like people, you know, you watch people walk and you go, wow, you're limping. And you're like, am I? Yeah, <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yeah. Um, because we've been doing that for so long. And so that's where Surefoot can help the habits of contact. Um, yeah. And with this horse, it, I mean, it was just, um, I wish I hadn't messed up the video. I, I My iPad flipped over <laughs> and he was filmed on the ceiling for the before. So it's a little, I have to do some rearranging, but um, it was so fascinating to see um, how much change occurred, but how much it affected the, she couldn't even really maintain a contact with his head being up so high. Yeah. Um, and then having him actually reaching down into the bit. So, you know, you're so right about the fact it's multidisciplinary um, dimensional. Yeah. We have to look at all these factors. And um, I have a story where I was working with Dr. Joyce Harmon and we were at a conference and we, she had the computer saddle pad there and I was going to be the demo rider. And it was in the winter and my horse had quite a coat, so I clipped him. And then um, I put a wool blanket on because I had a Western saddle for him. I put the wool blanket on and I put the Western saddle on and I rode him around. And then when we went to take the saddle off to put the, the computer pad on, I had given him rug burn. All of his hair was like, oh yeah, it was like that little fringy oh. burn. <laughs> and so he was really unhappy um, the whole time. You know, I mean, we were doing different saddles and some were even worse because for, fortunately Joyce can... She always gives him a treatment afterward and <laughs> fixes it after we had done things. But he expressed it all in his mouth. And yeah. the number of people that came up to me at the end and said, oh, you could use this bit or try a hackamore or do a side pull. I was like, I gave him rug burn. He's exactly. just trying to tell us I gave him rug burn. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm sometimes surprised because um, you have horses that have been walking fine on, on a bit for their whole life. And then suddenly they start to react really weird. And then people think, oh, must be the bit. And I'm like, no. If he has been on, on his bit perfectly and comfortable his whole life, maybe it's the bit because it's old and it's, it's gotten sharp, okay. But it's more likely that it's somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think uh, the bit fit consultants should have sort of function like, okay, we check, we check, we check. Yeah. And of course the bid and bridal, and then we tell you, okay, this is probably your answer to, uh, yeah, the solution of your problem. And then it's nice to combine stuff because, yeah, for me it's the, yeah, everything's coming together. I mean, my body work, my writing, my training, my coaching, and and the knowledge of bids. So I'm pretty happy with my job. <laughs> yeah, no, it's awesome. But that you know. When you, when you watch people and you see how, when we're upset, how we express so much with our mouth, right? You see people chewing their fingernails and fussing and, you yeah. know, I mean, the mouth is a very expressive area. And so yeah. why would we expect it to be any different for the horse? Yes, we have to make sure that the bit is, I absolutely agree. And we have to ask the question, like you say, is this a sudden change? Well, maybe yeah. something else has changed. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just interesting to, to figure it out. And uh, yeah, there's so, especially, I love to combine stuff. So I've, a ho I've had a horse that didn't foam on one side, mm -hmm. uh, but when I adjusted the pelvis or I made a small manipulation on the hind end, you suddenly saw it getting more straight and it did foam on two sides. And yeah. then you can perfect that with a bit afterwards. So it's, it's really cool to see that compensation patterns have certain preferences of certain kinds of bits as well. So, you know, like, oh, if the horse is doing that, this bit will fit. And if the, yeah, it's, it's really cool. <laughs> it is cool. It's really cool. And this has been a really cool um, webinar. You, do you happen to have a picture of a really well-fitting bridle? Oh, yeah, I should have, but I didn't put it in my, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want people to see what it, we've seen a lot of what we don't want to do, but it'd be nice to see of what we do want. Yeah, I don't have it. With, I, I don't have that ordered. Uh, okay. that much. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> no, but I can always uh, send you one. <laughs> you can put that up because I think, you know, that sometimes we just, we get so used to seeing it incorrect that we forget what it looks like when it's right. 
Yeah, true. But basically it's just, it's, you know, like with saddle fit, when I've taught people saddle fit, I've always said, you know, like the contact between the shoulder and the panel, you want it to feel like a nice fitting glove. When yeah. we see a good fit, our nervous system recognizes, we acknowledge it. We go, oh, you know, yeah. um, and when we, when we feel a little angst or a little uncomfortable, we need to start focusing that lens and going, well, what is it that makes me feel uncomfortable. And I think your photos were really great at focusing that lens and showing us like with the little red dots, these very specific things to start looking for. Um, yeah. Because sometimes it's, you know, we're not sure what we're looking at. Um, no, exactly. But just be sure when, when you have this gut feeling and you think something's wrong, then it, then it is, it is, it, it all, it, the horse is always telling you and, and your gut feeling is always right. Yep. Yep. Well, this has been a wonderful uh, webinar. Thank you so much, Natasha, for joining me today. And your English was fabulous. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I know sometimes my guests from, from, that speak other languages get a little nervous about the, the language, but it was great. It's very understandable, lovely presentation. I want to thank you so much for joining me today. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Just, and yeah, because we did, yep, Rhonda, Rhonda said very interesting and thank you. So just remember, you can find this and all the other webinars on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. If you subscribe, you'll get a notice every time we put up another webinar. And that's probably the easiest way to know when another one goes up. Um, tomorrow, my guest is Rebecca Housted. I think that's how I say her last name. And we're going to talk about um, technical large animal rescue. She's uh, been working with that, training people how to rescue horses, because you know you hear the stories of them getting stuck in places they should never be. So it should be a really interesting webinar, and I'm looking forward to that. It will also be at one o'clock. So thank you again, Natasha, and thank you everybody for joining me, and we'll see you tomorrow. Have a great afternoon. Bye. Bye. <laughs>